So everyone, this is uh, David Lofren. He's uh, passionate about supporting individuals to make the best decisions about their health. He's formerly a surgical trainee and an AI clinician for Babylon Health. Uh, Daffod is now the leads Concentrix Health's mission to empower individuals' abilities to make data-driven health decisions as the company CEO. Thank you very much for joining us today. Daffod, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great. Right. So can I, just, just before I kind of dive into things, um, maybe from one of you guys, do we have some context of kind of who's in, who's in the in the virtual room and um, what's the kind of what's the group and then I can I can pitch what I'm saying accordingly. Well, the fantastic thing is um, because we are on a virtual platform like this, everyone can just type. Um, so everyone who is watching um, in the comments, tell us where you're from and what stage you're at. So PhD student from Imperial College London, and right. let's. Yeah. Where Let's do that. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm watching the chat, so yeah, just picking that across. So I suppose most of my sessions um, are uh, pretty interactive and lots of questions. So I promise not to just uh, talk for half an hour because uh, no one really wants that. So um, essentially, I'm going to give some reflections on my journey as a slightly different uh, kind of clinical career and clinical journey and um, give you some context around what we're doing now. Um, and some of the kind of reflections of how that sort of got to that point. Um, and then really sort of to offer support going forward to others on the call who might be, uh, you know, facing some of the challenges of decisions that I've kind of made over the last, um, you know, five or six years really. So essentially, um, I was a surgical trainee, uh, always, you know, if you'd have asked my friends and colleagues um, and family, I was... I was one of those guys who kind of wanted to, you know, I was absolutely on it, doing doing everything, saying yes to everything. Um, and in reality, it was kind of, you know, saying yes to lots of things I should have been saying no to, I was doing my exams really early, um, and all this kind of stuff. And I, over sort of a bit of that time, got somewhat frustrated with, with the kind of system and, and the treadmill that I felt that we were on. And... You know, that's a, a reasonably common theme for uh, lots of kind of trainees in healthcare service, you know, systems, whether that's, uh, you know, junior doctors, nurses, staff, but also kind of um, wider healthcare professionals and scientists. And so I was kind of you know, increasingly thinking about other things that I would be interested in doing and was you know, reasonably tech, sort of techie background and um, was always writing and uh, kind of building little things for my own use um, on the front line, sort of on the wards and didn't feel that I had the sort of ability to be creative and kind of take those things and make them, make them real. So it got to the point where about uh, 2015 or so, I thought I probably wanted to be doing something slightly different um, and started having conversations with other people around, you know, what did other people, you know, if I mentioned to you that I'm thinking of leaving surgical training, having just done my surgical exams and this kind of stuff, you know, what do people kind of think about that? And, um, you know, what advice would, would you give me? And, and in reality, so I had some really, a couple of really tricky conversations. So I had um, one conversation in particular with, a, uh, with an education supervisor who essentially kind of said, uh, that's you're being completely ridiculous and um, you're waste, wasting all of this and uh, you know this is the path you're on uh, kind of get back in your box um, and that was kind of pretty challenging and we have very kind of strict hierarchies in medicine it's almost kind of um, military in that uh, in that regard and so it's quite difficult to shake that kind of um, that kind of feedback off but I had, I had started getting involved in um, a kind of a, a group of people across, across the UK who, uh, who are now kind of called the clinical entrepreneurs and, and that was kind of formalised through the NHS. But at the time it was just a, uh, a kind of group of what we kind of thought were kind of, we were kind of slightly, slight oddballs, uh, but we had these ideas about things that we could be doing and uh, things that we could be doing in, in tech to, to help and, and all these things we you know ideas we had or things that we were building and uh, we'd kind of love to be able to use them on the front line but um, 
you know, didn't really have the opportunity or the creative space to, to make those happen. Um, but that group certainly gave me some support in making some brave, in, in making some, you know, in inverted commas, brave decisions. There were certainly uh, decisions that most people around me in kind of Southeast Wales and in, in surgical training field thought I was being a bit crazy. So um, I essentially wanted to step out and do something in a kind of, you know, in a health technology space. I uh, didn't feel quite brave enough to do that in one step, to be fair. Um, so I did a, a leadership fellowship for a year and was really, really fortunate. So that's a year when you have, you know, you step out of training for a year um, but are still within the NHS and uh, are, are usually based around kind of a project, which is either you know, national informatics or something, uh, trying to deliver a project. And um, I was super, super lucky um, in that role that on the first, first Wednesday morning, uh, I sat down with my new supervisor for that for that year um, who you know it was a completely different conversation to, to the conversation that I'd had with um, you know with a training program director with an education supervisor previously um, and basically kind of said you know we're kind of interested to see what what you come up with the ideas that you have you know it's really valuable to get fresh eyes and, and fresh perspectives on, on some of the challenges that we're facing as a as a health board, you know, you're straight out of being, you know, a frontline junior doctor, as it were. Um, so we think that there could be a lot of value there. And, and really, I was given a huge amount of um, flexibility for that year to think about the things I want to be thinking about and um, play around with solutions and, and sort of prototypes and all this kind of stuff. Um, and ended up doing uh, some informatics work in, in kind of predicting uh, how soon we should be seeing people from primary care to secondary care um, and off the back of that I ended up going to Babylon Health as um, an AI clinician so looking at their uh, kind of triage algorithms a uh, really really interesting year and um, some of you on the call will know about Babylon uh, often a very controversial company uh, but have certainly kind of pushed the boundaries in terms of, of digital health for, um, over the last few years and our other kind of uh, unicorn uh, company in, in the UK um, and one of the reflections on, on kind of making that step so so that was a step that I thought I wanted to do a year before I uh, hadn't been quite brave enough to make that step in kind of one fell swoop I sort of kind of stayed within the system and then uh, a year down the line I almost didn't have to have those conversations with some of the guys in the surgical pathway because I'd been kind of slightly out of the system for a year um, and felt a bit braver to to go and uh, do something different. But but again, there's lots of challenges around um, you know that decision. So again, this was this was me much more formally kind of saying uh, that I'm you know maybe not following this this surgical training path, and it wasn't just going to be a year that I did something different. And and that brought lots of questions and challenges. Both uh, kind of I mean I suppose. From that perspective, it was lots of that was more around family decisions. So it was actually, um, you know, based in Cardiff, uh, uh, pregnant, uh, pregnant wife uh, was going to London four days a week, and you know that was quite different to being able to work in a hospital just around the corner. You know, I can see the Heath Hospital from my, from, from from the window of the house here, um, and so that brought lots of kind of both professional and um, personal decisions, but I kind of reflect on how that, that feels now a few years down the line, but certainly getting into a very different space. So this was a startup which was uh, eight, 80 people when I joined it and 800 people by the time I left 18 months later, um, 80 to 800, you can imagine the kind of challenges and uh, you know everything that goes on in a company when, it's, when it changes that quickly. And also just getting a feel of, well, actually, how do decisions get made in different scenarios and different spaces? So, you know, this is a very commercial organisation, uh, feels very different to uh, kind of an NHS approach and a, and a research approach, is, which were the kind of spaces that I had known. Um, and as a clinician, that's a really, you know, an interesting but often a challenging space to say, well, actually, you know, do I feel comfortable with some of these differences? Uh, what are the what are the good points from this element? What are the bits from 
you know, NHS practice or research work that actually I think is really valuable to bring into that kind of, um, you know, startup kind of space. Um, and I think often we don't spend the time to really think and reflect about um, how those challenges and, um, you know, how you deal with those challenges and, and what you learned from those different scenarios. But um, I worked at Babylon, but I also worked at uh, Public Health Wales in a shared decision making role um, one day a week. Quite a kind of, kind of a, an interesting story in terms of um, kind of almost falling into an opportunity. So uh, I had done some work around consent, which we'll sort of get to in terms of where that's ended up. But I'd done some work around consent when I was a junior doctor, so it was a kind of techie background and always played around with bits and bobs. And one of them was a was a consent uh, web web app, essentially a resource that. Uh, initially I built for my own use uh, to uh, guide my conversations around um, get, you know having a consent, consent conversation with uh, with patients um, and so I'd, I'd been in that space and we published some stuff around you know standardizing practice and we'd done a little digital you know e-form but nothing really very much more than that that was very much you know when I was a junior doctor, this was kind of a bedroom project, nothing really um, more than that at the time. But actually, in, um, whilst I was at Babylon, um, public health were looking for a, um, someone to take over a role that had been a, a consultant role that one day a week, um, guiding the kind of strategy around shared decision making. And essentially someone came to me and said, Dad, you've done some stuff in kind of consent and shared decision making. Um, you know, I've seen this job description, what do you think? And I kind of looked at it and it was a, it was a um, consultant pay grade salary um, on the job advert and, you know, it was public health Wales and I was a surgical trainee and was now doing some stuff in health tech. It was, it was completely not the job description that you would imagine that you'd go for. Um, but I just kind of emailed and said, well, um, I don't know how many people, uh, you know, will go for this job because it's, it's quite niche. Uh, I've done some stuff in the space. Uh, maybe I could support the person who comes into this role or, or something like that. Um, and in the end, I was, I was given that role um, because actually I had been thinking about that sort of kind of consent and shared decision making space for, for a number of years. So actually I was, I was kind of perfectly placed to, to do that work, even though I was quite a different beast to the, the kind of person who'd been in that, in that role beforehand. So that was kind of a, you know, just in terms of reflecting of things that you, if you really thought about it, you probably wouldn't have gone for, but it just kind of happened and, and fell through. And then the concentric story starts really then in late 2018. So we had, as I said, done a very, very, very light touch pilot um, at Imperial with a, with a digital consent form. So, um, uh, sort of a surgical consent form is where there's a you know before any procedure or operation uh, you document you know who the patient is what the surgical procedure is uh, the sort of risks and benefit of that procedure and get you know signatures uh, from yourself and the patient to kind of say yeah we've been through this and we're um, happy to proceed so we had done a really really light touch um, pilot just digitizing that information but not uh, not digitizing the signature or anything like that um, at Imperial and we published some stuff showing what you expect in terms of uh, you know reduction of variation and, and things like that but nothing nothing particularly um, interesting but one of one of the guys I was working with Ed Sinjin um, at Imperial had uh, gone to a PhD came back and there were some people in, in the department using this really really basic basic platform and we'd also noticed that just based on having a kind of landing page saying uh, we did, did th this work uh, we're kind of interested in doing something with this in the future maybe if something um if, you know if, if someone's interested um, and we were getting contact every every week 10 days uh to say oh we're looking for a digital consent platform do you have anything um, and i'd be emailing back saying oh uh, you know, thanks for getting in touch but um we really don't and so there was those contacts, there was still some people in Imperial using this platform. Um, and I was based at Babylon doing some work with some really, really, really bright data scientists. So um, one of the really exciting things about um, the kind of next few years in health tech for me is that there are lots of super, super bright people um, 
you know, whether that's data scientists, epidemiologists, you know, all the people in the kind of digital health space, lots of them have been uh, working in, in non-health spaces for the last, you know, five, ten years. You know, lots of the amazing people I was working with at Babylon, um, you know, had been at Google, had been at Facebook, had been, you know, working in gamble tech and all this kind of stuff. And, and so many of them, you know, there's a pull towards doing things in healthcare that, that really matter. And so for me, there's a real opportunity in terms of health tech to say, you know, we can now, you know, there is the opportunity to do some really interesting stuff in, in healthcare and health tech um, beyond the, the kind of traditional informatics that, that healthcare, you know, IT has been for the last um, decade. There were, there were these people I was working with and they were saying, well, I wish you guys were working on, you know, on this pet project that I've been interested in around um, surgical outcomes and predicting outcomes and visualising that and supporting patient and clinician to really be able to engage with, understand and um, own decisions about their care. And, you know, again, it's a, it's a, bit, of, a bit of a matter of kind of seeing just maybe a glimpse of an opportunity and and seizing something that you know it'd be really easy to ignore and not do anything about so there were these you know little pockets of things you know there was people coming to us asking whether we had something which we didn't and um, there was a platform that some people seemed to be getting some value from and there was this opportunity so well, actually there's this bigger thing around predicting outcomes wouldn't it be amazing to be able to do something around that and um, and we just kind of went to Innovate UK, um, so the kind of UK research and innovation body, and said, uh, we can't really do this ourselves. We're kind of, again, not brave enough to say, right, let's take a loan out for 100 grand and do something. Uh, but, you know, if someone could, you know, give us some money to maybe pay some developers and, and get something done, then maybe there's something interesting to, to do here. Um, and then there's an interesting kind of uh, a couple of months there, so... So we um, we initially were told, um, sorry, no, you applied for um, a similar grant. So Innovate works. You can you can usually apply for something twice, but not a third time. And we'd I I kind of applied for some really small grants um, back when I'd started writing this thing basically for myself. Um, and so the the kind of response saying, oh, sorry, that this is uh, not materially different to the application kind of five years ago. Um, so sorry you can't do it and then and you know then there was kind of a decision then say okay right do we kind of just say fine fair enough let's leave it at that or do we find some angle to say oh you know this is different in this way or and in reality it was you know pretty different it was five years down the line you know lots of things had changed and so we managed to convince them to to kind of accept the application um, and then one uh, random friday evening uh in late 2018 we simply had an email to say um here's you know almost half a million to um go and, and and make make this thing happen so really to to transform how we make decisions about our healthcare to say you know how do we drive towards shared data-driven decisions initially around surgical care but then kind of in the future um you know broader than that so that's kind of what we've been doing over the last year. We've um, just going live in our first uh, first site. So um, just been told that Imperial have all signed off to go live across breast surgery on Wednesday. So that's um, great news. Uh, it takes a long time to get these things into live clinical use. Um, and there's a huge amount of hurdles and barriers. And um, again, this is this is all about persistence. It would be super, super, super easy to. Uh, to give up along this path and and the reality is that kind of most most do but if you if you uh, persevere then um you know things do happen eventually and um, so that's really you know exciting digital consent platform but also you know we, we've done a lot of work around what do patients need in terms of that and um, that surgical journey so for us the, the challenge has been in terms of understanding what the current process is what how that system currently works but then kind of understanding what kind of fits around that system and that um uh, you know what already exists and, and where are those real big opportunities to support patient care and um, so that that's kind of a really high level of what we're doing but the ref the reflection for me is um for this group in terms of talking about kind of 
different clinical careers and and making decisions about which way to go is that actually the you know the conversations that I have um, with those people because I now often you know I now go back into hospitals and talk to the surgeons and, and do lots of testing and um, get their kind of buy-in to go live with things and um, and actually those conversations have changed so much so actually um, a few months ago I had a conversation with um, with the person who I had a really difficult conversation with back in 2015 um, and that kind of disbelief of what you know what are you doing like, why on earth are you doing this I don't know anyone who's done this um, this is clearly crazy um, and actually that turned to to admiration and kind of you know some respect at um at really the perseverance and and to make it happen and um you know he kind of said you know yeah i i couldn't i couldn't see the way this was going to to work work out for you because uh i hadn't kind of seen it it wasn't what my generation had done um but fair do to you and um <laughs> lots of lots of you know that generation now like oh god you know uh, given the pressures and you know pension complications and all that kind of stuff, you know, I almost wish I was in in your shoes. So, um, that's been kind of really interesting to watch and um, to to kind of see and just you know, it's not about saying you know I I was right, but it's saying you know actually sometimes if you if you have a feeling that something is right and you want to do something slightly different, then um, not always, but you know, often, often your gut is kind of, kind of right in that space. And um, so some reflections on, on kind of the wider picture. So there is no doubt that uh, kind of health technology and um, sort of health science and how that kind of whole ecosystem is, is developing is, is really accelerating. So we see, you know, from these tech companies right through to, you know, massive increases in, in, in health startups and, um, there are lots and lots and lots of opportunities to be doing, uh, doing things, uh, having different roles in different, you know, different environments with different people to, to those that you might have, you know, gone into your uh, degree or PhD or you know into your current role of thinking that that you were going to do, and um, and there's a real shortage of people, uh, in you know, given given how that um, space is increasing, a real shortage of people who. You know, really understand the medicine, really understand the science, understand how systems work, understand kind of actually how would that really work in real practice outside of the kind of tech startup bubble. Um, and so there are lots of opportunities to do really interesting stuff there. And um, there's definitely a broadening in what what your career could look like compared to you know what you thought, what your seniors might think. Um, uh, so I'm just seeing some questions. Um, so, and when a little note I've just written to myself here is, um, some people kind of say, you know, it's it's you know, how does it feel to have left medicine? And um, and really, I, I would kind of say that I, I I haven't left medicine. I, I know why you're asking me that question, but I I don't feel as if I've left medicine. I actually think clinically, kind of more deeply and and, and more than I probably did on on the wards really. That that's kind of it's very different, but it's certainly not less clinical. Um, and just, just kind of to remember that having different experiences is almost never going to be a bad idea. You know, different experiences are always going to be valuable. And um, kind of saying that I sometimes say to myself is, you know, the grass is not always going to be greener, but kind of understanding different textures, slightly different colours of grass, it's always going to be valuable. Um, it not, might not be greener, but you'll have a better understanding of that grass. Um, so that's kind of um, some reflections for me and um, no particular learning for you guys, but hopefully, um, you know, to, to some listening, there's uh, something that, that resonates or something that's made you, made you kind of uh, think or question. Um, but really, I am super, super happy and um, really ask you to reach out and uh, very happy to sort of have any conversations and just kind of reflect further on, uh, on where I am, where you are and how that might um, kind of fit together. So thanks, thanks all. Uh, thanks for sort of the opportunity to share share the story. And um, over to you guys. Thanks very much. Pleasure. Thank you. I, I have a quick question. You you talked about your recent success in getting your uh, digital health forms, consent forms accepted at Imperial. 
and, yeah. you, and you made the offhand comment that, oh, it takes a very long time to go from a startup to actually implementing it in practice. Uh, I know this is kind of falls into something that we're going to discuss later with research translation, but what were some of the regulatory hoops, the, the red tape that you had to go through to actually get your, your product yeah. implemented on the front lines? Can you expand? Yeah, so, so, so one of the big challenges for me for um, you know, NGES systems is that these are, these are big organizations and, and if you compare, you know, if, you, if you need to know something about Concentric, you can almost certainly come to me and I'll have a pretty good grasp of, of it. Um, or at least I'll be able to kind of tap the person sitting next to me and I can get that answer very quickly. Um, in big organizations, so actually, you know, we're deploying in Imperial, Swansea, Jersey, there's a few places very soon. And, and it's, it's often a, a kind of a similar feel. Um, but these are big organizations where everyone kind of knows their little pocket. Um, and that makes sense because they're doing lots of that kind of narrow thing and so they need to be good at that thing so they might know you know a tiny little path of that uh, you know information governance piece but it does mean that um a they almost certainly you know there's essentially no one in those systems who knows that end-to-end -end journey um, and so can't really navigate you you know there's no one who can navigate you through that process and, and also it means that they don't have great visibility of, of the risk in the other bits of the system because they only know their bit. So it's quite difficult to take kind of pragmatic approaches or kind of um, shift any uh, from your kind of normal practice. So it's very difficult to take, uh, take a slightly different or slightly more nuanced approach to a small startup versus, you know, Cerner or Epic or some big, you know, um, medical record systems. Um, and so that's some of the challenges in terms of, you know, it, you almost have to go through it in these tiny little steps with no great visibility of how close you are to the end. So I, I sometimes use the analogy of, um, it's like, a, like playing a computer game where uh, you have different uh, levels and you're fighting people. Um, and sometimes you come up against a boss. So every few levels you come up against a boss. And you're never quite sure whether that's the big boss or if there's a big boss still to come. Um, so for me, one of the big opportunities for kind of digital health and deployments is for there to be some really great navigators in these um, in these organisations who basically say, okay, yeah, great. Uh, we, we, I've actually done this a few times. I've walked people through this process. So I kind of know what that looks like and I can point you to the right place. Because otherwise, each of these kind of startups and SMEs has to work that out individually for each trust and that's it's you know really time consuming mm -hmm. cool well thank you uh over to some of the questions we got in the chat the last one we have is uh would your technology be relevant internationally or is it just aimed for the nhs yeah so um internationally we're actually doing some deployments um uh, one in brisbane one in the uae uh, one in Jersey and a, and a few in the UK um, over the next six months. So there are little nuances. So there are um, some nuances in terms of technology and there are some nuances in terms of um, systems and then there are some really interesting things in terms of cultural things. So, you know, for example, uh, we've been working out like, what's our approach in the UAE where uh, a husband can usually consent for their wife for a procedure, even with their wife not in the room. Um, and so there's there's always going to be, you know, little things that are different culturally and, and systems-wise, but um, certainly there is a, a move towards using the same standards internationally, so that certainly, the, you know, the technology piece uh, can be, you know, in Imperial, in Oxford, in Canada, wherever. Um, so have you spoken to any patients um, who have used your platform and have you had kind of personal feedback um, yeah. you know, so we, taking to it? Yeah, so we've actually done quite a lot of patient feedback. So, so we see the, um, the opportunity for patients um, as a really big opportunity. So what I mean by that is that in a, in a healthcare system, um, actually when you show uh, if you show concentric to uh, clinicians and it's uh, it's the same kind of story with lots of startups is that the amount of change that you can uh, kind of sell to clinicians is often quite small certainly if you've come from 
um, you know, a, a commercial startup place where you really want to disrupt stuff. Um, in healthcare, there's you know it's a you know little steps on, are the way to go usually in terms of um, things that fit within the system. But then, so if you if you take our use case, actually in terms of moving from a paper consent form to a digital consent form, what we're doing a consent form is not you know hugely co complex in that in that space. You know we're doing some uh, you know e-consent stuff, and then there's a bit of a different view for having a conversation between clinician and patient. Um, and even having that kind of um, you know shared view on a on a tablet is pushing the boundaries for lots of our clinicians, and and there's certainly a gen generational piece there. But then there's the opportunity then to say actually we're you know we're in that we're being used in the system, um, and so we need to communicate to patients. But then we can there's much more flexibility in terms of um, what we can you know what patients will engage with. Um, because we've got all that space outside of a 10 minute consultation and um, all the other time, you know, before their surgery and after the surgery and, and throughout that journey. And um, so there's, there's a slightly different approach in terms of what you do within the system and then what you do for patients outside of the kind of traditional um, organization. Great. Um... There's a question here from Jake. What advice would you yeah. give to academics or medics with an idea that they want to translate into tangible products or startups? Yeah, so I think, so I, I sort of end up having um, a number of conversations with people from the kind of clinical entrepreneur group and, and this kind of stuff. And um, what I would say is that, so lots of people have an idea, right? And it's often very tempting to go, so A, it's, often tempting to kind of jump out and uh, kind of be like, oh, I've got this idea, I want to do it, I'm going to do it. But um, often you can get a long, long way without kind of either jumping out of, you know, your job and training. You, if, and there's also a lot of value in being in that system. So actually myself with a, you know, an email signature that now says CEO, uh, my responses are often, but you know, before having an initial conversation where I can kind of show that I'm a clinician and all this kind of stuff, and the reaction to that is often quite different to when my signature kind of said public health consultant. You know, it's, uh, so there's kind of value in getting lots of feel and feedback around, you know, is this just an idea that I kind of have, but no one else shares and no one else sees value? Um, or is it something that uh, actually other people are like, oh God, yeah. Or you, you know, you go to everyone and they're like, yes, I've been thinking the same thing. We should do that. Or, you know, there's 50 different te like research teams looking at the same problem and publishing things, but no one's kind of, kind of cracked it. Um, and then also, there's also a temptation in this world to go out to uh, development like, agencies, like, you know, um, people who have like developers and you can pay them a few thousand pounds to kind of do something just um, most of the time that's not the right thing to do you can prototype things um, without writing a single line of code uh, you prototype things to a point where you can click through um, and get you know people can give you a feel so if you think about um, the iPhone launch in 2007 uh, so Steve Jobs uh, in that keynote uh, did not have a functioning phone so all he could do on that phone was click certain buttons and it did certain things. Um, it was a prototype which they kind of had started building. They'd, you know, they'd started building this phone because they thought it was a good idea. They were pretty sure, but they weren't quite sure how quickly that would um, you know, be taken up and things. Um, and then the response to that in, I think it was August 2007, was, was so positive that they basically went, wow, okay, we actually have to build this thing. Um, so let's let's move from a prototype to things. So you know the, the saying is kind of fake it till you make it. You can work out a, a look. You, you know you can really work out if this is a good idea and something that you could actually you know make a startup um, without kind of building things. Great. Well, um, your talk has been really insightful. I think it's been really nice to hear a kind of very personal side of things and. Uh, I think, although you said that we probably didn't learn much, I think actually we probably did learn a lot. Um, okay. Just hearing about, you know, what processes you went through and how it came to be and, and how you answered the questions.